morning. It's good worship, huh? It's a good morning. It's a good time to be here. <laughs> need to give you all a second. Y'all were starting to get more wound up. That was good. That was good. Listen, I am so excited to get to share uh, with you guys this morning. Uh, I was just telling uh, Owen, who brought my, my podium out this morning, I, I think I'm nervous. Um, but I get, I get nervous every time I do this because I'm excited about what I get to share. But in my excitement, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm sharing truth, right? And so the cool thing that I get to lean on is the Holy Spirit to help you hear the things that are right. And hopefully he'll not let you hear anything dumb that I say, all right? So I'm trusting in that this morning. So no, it's going to be a good morning. I'm excited to get to start this new series called Questions from Jesus. And so it prompted me to look up some questions, maybe some popular questions that are asked. And so one of the things I ran across was questions from kids. And so how many of you guys have kids? How many of you guys kids ask questions? Yeah, just leave your hands up. The rest of you know, right? This is what kids are for, right? This is how they learn. I'm not sure I want them learning some of the stuff they're asking questions about. But either way, they're asking questions. And so parents submitted these. And so these are some of the questions their kids asked. Uh, it says, my son asked me if the letter W starts with D. And I can't stop thinking about that. Think about it for a second. W. Hmm. <laughs> While driving to the store, my daughter asked if we were inside the car's stomach. What a terrifying way to see the world. Uh, my son just asked me how I know his name. She responded, I'm not in the mood today. <laughs> Why did swear words get invented if we're not allowed to say them? Mm. Hey, Dad, are there infinite words? No, son, but there are infinite numbers. Well, if there's a word for every number, then there must be infinite words. Things to ponder, right? Top questions on a Google search. What to watch? Nine million people. Where's my refund? Seven million people. What is my IP address? Four million people. How many ounces in a cup? What time is it? Where am I? If you type that into Google on your smartphone, there's another app on there you should probably be using that will tell you where you are. We'll share that later. And then last, my favorite that I may or may not have typed in multiple different ways, how to lose weight fast. All right, we're never looking for the long, uh, the long way to lose weight, right? So in this series, questions Jesus asked. We, we know that Jesus used questions to, uh, to help teach, right? To help make the disciples and other people he was teaching. And as, as we read his word, we see those questions and they prompt us to think in a certain way. And sometimes they're used to correct us. And so we've selected a few of those to dig into over the next few weeks. And they are as follows. Do you still not understand? Do you love me? Do you want to get well? And do you want to leave too? And so all these are questions posed by Jesus. And so today, the question of the day is, who do you say I am? And so this seems like a pretty simple question, right? If you were typically in your day, uh, maybe you wake up in the morning and you have, you know, your daughter or son there and like, they're like, hey, mom, dad, who do you say I am? pretty easy question or should be. Some of you would probably be more creative than others in your response, but the simple answer is you could say, well, you're my daughter or you're my son or you are and state their name, right? That's a pretty easy response. Same thing it would be if it was your spouse asking you this question. You'd say, oh, well, you're my wife or you're my husband. In my case, I would say, well, you're, you're Crystal. You're my, you're my wife. That's an easy question. Who do you say I am? The difficulty today that we're going to kind of navigate through is not the question itself, but it's who's asking the question. Um, and Jesus is the one asking the question today. And so um, I want you to answer this question. Right? You guys have, there should be note cards somewhere near you. If you, you can write it on your hand. You can pull a sticky note out of your purse. Some of you guys come in here with full-blown journals. That's fine. But I want you in this moment, to pretend like Jesus is right here and he's saying, hey, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? And I want you to jot your answer down on that card. Don't show it to anybody. You don't have, we're not passing it in. We're not getting a grade. You don't get a better, you know, a four-bedroom mansion in heaven if you answer this correctly today. Like none of, none of that is, is coming into play here. But I want you to write your answer down. And so 
we're going to have the answer today. By the end of this, I will have repeated this answer about 40 times, I think. Um, I was counting while I was saying them last, last service. But I want you to write this answer down. Who do you say I am, as Jesus was asking it? And then as we walk through today, you may see that you need to write down a different answer. You may see that you have this answer and you've been living this way and you understand this, the answer to this question like you need to. So write that down. Hang on to that, all right? And we're going to jump in. So we're going to be in uh, Matthew chapter 16 today. And so before I get too far into uh, Matthew, I want to give you just a little bit of a, I want to catch us up in the book of Matthew where we're at so you can see um, what the disciples are dealing with. We're going to talk about Pharisees and Sadducees and who they are. And, and, and this, it's important to see uh, what Jesus' ministry, what his ministry life has been like to this point. So uh, in Matthew, and it'll be up here, some of the, the high points of what is happening here. In Jesus' ministry in Matthew, he calls his first disciples. Um, he heals many who are sick. Um, he preaches the Sermon on the Mount. He heals a centurion servant. He restores two demon possessed men. He heals Peter's mother in law and then many others. He heals and forgives a paralyzed man. He raises a girl from a dead. He heals a blind mute. He feeds the 5,000, walks on water, and then feeds the 4,000. Right? So there's a lot that has happened in this, this period of time in the, the, uh, the documentation in Matthew. Uh, so Jesus is with his disciples, and then many others are around them as they're traveling and moving. And they're getting to see what Jesus is doing. They're seeing that um, what his ministry is and, and what he's wanting people to see. They're getting to, to see the miracles that are happening. They're getting to hear from Jesus and, and learn from him. And so one of my favorite things, 5,000 people is a lot. To feed, right? And 4,000 people is a lot to feed. And Jesus did it starting off with very little. And, and we know from, from historical records that that 5,000 and 4,000 didn't even include the women and children. That was just the men that were there. So it was a lot of thousands more than that that Jesus fed. And so this is really important here in a minute because we're going uh, to talk about eating and bread, which is one of my favorite subjects. So uh, remember these things that Jesus did. And so all this happened before we get to chapter 16 in Matthew. And so all these things were experienced by the disciples and many others were around that were around at the time. And so I want to jump to Matthew 16 verse 13. Um, and then I will go back and, and address the, the interaction with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the disciples. So Matthew 16 verse 13 says this, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And so this is not our question of the day today, right? But it's very similar. He's asking the disciples, who do people say? The people that are around, the people they've interacted with, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And so why do you think Jesus was asking the question in this moment? Right? Jesus had been ministering with the disciples. Jesus came to make himself known. Um, and if you have read the word or, or been fortunate enough to watch any of the chosen episodes, you know Jesus said multiple times, hey, don't tell anybody who I am. Don't say who I am. I know you've seen this miracle. I know you're excited. I know you want to share, but it's not time yet. Right? So Jesus, Jesus came and he, he was ministering to people. And so the disciples should have kind of been picking up on the fact that Jesus was different. There was something else happening here. But Jesus hadn't told them yet that, hey, I'm the Messiah. Go tell everyone. Right, And so why does he ask this question now? Uh, one of the interactions he had, or several interactions he had with the Pharisees and Sadducees, which were religious leaders in that day, um, they were trying to uh, basically curb his, his leadership. They were trying to keep him from being any more influential than he was. The Pharisees were very concerned about their laws and, and their religion, right? and they, they wanted to protect that. They, they wanted to um, make sure that whoever was in political power would let them do whatever they wanted. As long as they could uh, operate how they wanted, they were going to be happy. The Sadducees, on the other hand, they also wanted what they wanted, but they didn't mind using the political powers of the day to do that. And so what's crazy is, is those two groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, didn't really hang out a lot. They, they disagreed. One was trying to use political power. The other one was trying to avoid any political power as long as they could do what they want. But they had joined forces against Jesus. 
Because Jesus was doing something radical. He was doing something different. This list that we just ran down, word was, was carrying out that this man was performing these miracles and he was doing things different. And, um, and man, he's going to take over what we've got going on if we don't try to stop him. And so uh, they were plotting against him because he was challenging their laws and their political power. They, they didn't see that he was the fulfillment of the promises made in Scripture that they held so dear. And so it was pretty clear Jesus had some work to do to get the Pharisees and Sadducees to follow him. And so maybe, maybe he asked, who do the people say I am to the disciples? Because he was trying to get them to see the full picture of what was going on, what was happening all around them, not just in the moment, not just in the conversations with Jesus and being taught by Jesus, but what else was happening all around them. And so, um, so the disciples answered, they said, well, they think you're John the Baptist, they think you're Elijah, they think you're Jeremiah, or, or maybe one of the prophets. And so uh, there's speculation that maybe the people answered this way because they didn't really know who John the Baptist was. Most of us know who John the Baptist is. He was, uh, he was a messenger that was sent, right? He was proclaiming that Jesus is coming, and so we know that he was Jesus' cousin, and they're not the same person, but maybe some of the people didn't know this, and they're like, well, we've heard about this guy that's coming, and he's, man, what he's teaching, it's, it's something different than what we grew up learning in the, it's this different idea, and there's something uh, different about this man, Jesus. And so uh, some of them thought he may have been a prophet. Um, and so Jesus moved very quickly uh, from asking uh, who do the people say I am? He didn't discuss this a whole lot with the disciples because it seems that there was a question that was even more important than who do the people say I am. So he moves on quickly to verse 15 and says, but what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Can you imagine in that moment um, being with Jesus, who has already challenged them with teaching and, and, and challenged them just by the way he was living life and the things he was going about and doing uh, as, as God in the flesh. The disciples were excited, and, and I don't know if you've ever been asked a question like, hey, how do you think this person feels about this situation? And it's easier for us to tell that other person's story, Right? Because we don't, we don't have to be responsible for their story. But now Jesus has flipped it around and said, So I know who you say, people say I am, but who do you say I am? Can you imagine what it felt like to have to own that in that moment? To be like, wow, Jesus, I thought we were talking about everybody else, so now you're kind of pointing at me. That's kind of rude, right? Nobody said that to Jesus, but it had to be something you were, they were feeling in that moment. What do you mean, who do we say you are? What, why is that different? Why, why are you changing this? And so... Why, why do you suppose Jesus pointed directly at them and asked this question? If we back up in Matthew verses, uh, chapter 16, verses uh, 5 through 12, Jesus was warning the disciples about the experience he had had with the Pharisees and Sadducees. He was saying, hey, their doctrine is wrong, heads up. But the way Jesus chose to say it was a way that wasn't uncommon in Scripture. He said, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So yeast was a word that they used to compare um, sin, what sin does in our lives, right? How many of you guys have ever put yeast in some dough and watch what happens, right? It absolutely changes, hopefully, right? Some of you sourdough loaf people are really frustrated that it didn't work and didn't make your loaf swell up, but that's all right. What yeast does, it takes over that whole uh, chunk of dough and it makes it swell, right? The same thing that sin does in our life. It takes over. And so Jesus said, beware of the yeast of the Sadducees and Pharisees. What he's saying is beware of their sin. Beware of their false doctrine. And the disciples immediately said, oh my gosh, I know why he used that word yeast there. It's because we forgot to bring bread on this journey. Right? And as you look, you see where they forgot to bring provisions for the journey that they were on. And so they all thought, Jesus, listen, this sounds like something one of us would do, right? A sarcastic comment to get a point across, right? Jesus doesn't operate that way. He didn't operate that way. But they thought because they'd forgotten the bread that Jesus was, was getting on to them. And they totally missed what he was doing. He was trying to warn them. So I have to wonder, I have to, I have to think to myself that he's asking them, who do you say I am? Because they don't seem to be grasping what is happening all around them, right? I know for us, as we read through a list of the miracles that Jesus did in the, the, the ministry, it's so easy for us to go, oh my gosh, this is, Jesus is so different than everything else we've seen. It's easier for us to see. 
But what if Jesus was here asking you the same question just like he did the disciples? I know at times when I've done things that I shouldn't or I've got this guilty feeling that I've done something that, or I've made a choice that I shouldn't have made, when, when Jesus is convicting me and helping me to walk through that, sometimes I'm like, well, you're just pointing it out again, Jesus. And he's like, no, I'm, I'm helping you. I'm trying to help you walk through this. And so I have to believe that Jesus is not only helping them to see the big picture of what's going on, but specifically he wants them to see who he is and he wants them to process that and think about it. And so um, as they entered Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked them the question, who am, who am I to the people and who am I to you? Uh, William Barclay writes in one of the commentaries, he said, Caesarea Philippi was an area associated with idols and rival deities. So if, if somebody said, hey, we you know, went on vacation, we went to Caesarea Philippi, they would be known as a place where lots of people came and they, they worshiped different deities and, uh, and so uh, different idols. And so it was a known place uh, where people came and, and did that. And so it says, the area was scattered with temples of the ancient Syrian Baal worship. Uh, by Caesarea Philippi, there rose a great hill in which was a deep cavern, and that cavern was said to be the birthplace of the great god Pan, the god of nature. In Caesarea Philippi, there was a great temple of white marble built to the godhead of Caesar. It is as if Jesus deliberately set himself against the background of the world's religion and all their history and splendor and demanded to be compared to them and to have the verdict given in his favor. And so imagine if you can. Being a disciple, following Jesus, seeing all the things that have happened, uh, seeing the Pharisees and Sadducees working against him, trying to stop him, being warned by Jesus that their doctrine is a false doctrine, and then entering into this place that is just overrun with idol worship, right? It, it, there are temples to everything, people worshiping Caesar, people worshiping the God of nature, right? And Jesus stops and looks at you and says, who do you say I am? In the midst of all of this, I love this word picture uh, that William Barclay gives us where he says, it's almost as if Jesus deliberately set himself against the background of the world's religion and all their history and splendor and demanded to be compared to them and to have the verdict given in his favor. So it was in this moment where Jesus is saying, you can see all of this that's going on, all of this worship, all of these people's commitment to these things that are man-made. Who do you say I am? Who do you see before you? Can you imagine being a person, being asked that question? Being, being in that moment, in that place with all the things that have happened up to this point. And Jesus says, who do you say I am? And so Simon Peter, the disciple that was known to have, stick his foot in his mouth all the time. You guys have heard that before. I am so glad there was a Simon Peter because it makes me feel like it's okay for me to be me. Right? And so I had a, a pastor in my, in my childhood that said uh, Peter was one of the guys who he would only take his foot out of his mouth long enough to put the other one back in it. Peter was always saying things and spouting off. And he answered quickly here in verse 16 to respond to the question of who do you say I am? And he said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And this is the answer to our question today. If someone says, who do you say Jesus is? You say, he is the Messiah, the son of the living God. Messiah means anointed one, the one that was said he was coming. Right? We see all throughout the Old Testament, the foreshadowing of Jesus is, is coming. He is the anointed one, the one that God said, I am giving you. I'm, I'm sending him to you because you as a people, we as a people, all of us need a savior. And he is the one that was sent. The anointed one, the, the son, not a son, of the living God, not a living God, the only God. He is the Messiah, the son of the living God. And so Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gate of Hades, gates of Hades will not overcome it. So who do you say I am? Why did Jesus ask this question? He asked this question because he needed the disciples to see that he was different. The same reason that this question is important now is because we need to recognize that Jesus is different. He's different than any other thing we may want to worship. He's far different than anything that we can come up with. He is the one and only Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Son of the living God. 
This question evokes something in all of us. It makes us, it pushes us to answer it. There are other questions we can kind of push to the side, but if you are committing your life, if you have committed your life to follow Christ, to to do what He has asked, to follow Him, then this question should be one that we should be able to answer just like that. Every time it's the same because just as Scripture says, this is the foundation of the church. Not Peter. Peter's not the foundation of the church, but the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That is the foundation of the church. And that is the foundation of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Right? Why would we have that relationship with Him if He was not the Messiah, the Son of the living God? Right? And if Jesus is not the Messiah, if He was just a prophet, or just a a great moral teacher, then we, right now in this moment, are still sitting waiting for the Messiah because Scripture tells us that He's coming. And so if He wasn't, then we're still sitting and waiting without hope and we're trying to fix our problems on our own. Right? It changes everything if the answer to this question is not that He is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. It changes everything. Why would we be sitting here if He wasn't? Right? Why would we be gathered hearing teaching about him? If he was a prophet or a good teacher or a great moral man, then there's a lot that we can learn from him. We can look at his life and say, hey, that was honorable, that was good. But we'd still be without hope. We would still be responsible to pay for our own sin debt. This is what happens when, when Scripture tells us that we've all sinned and we've fallen short of the glory of God, which means we can't be in a relationship with him. Right? We can't pray to him and him hear us. Right? If Jesus was just a good moral teacher, we can know some right from wrong, but again, we're still left to pay for our sin, that we've, we've sinned against a holy and righteous God. But He is the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one who teaches us everything we need to know. He guides us where we need to be. And then He says, He says, do all of these things. And then He reaches out His hand and says, I got you, come on. No other God has offered that. Whether man-made or dreamed up or whatever it is, no other God in history that has ever been talked about has ever said, this is right, this is wrong, come with me, I will show you, and I will give you what you need in order to be who I've called you to be. All the rest of them say, do this, good luck. Honor me, and if you don't, I'm sorry, you're out. But God sent his son, Jesus Christ, and Jesus said, I am the Messiah the son of the living God. Here is what you should do. I'm going to live a life that's perfect so you can see what it looks like. I'm going to die for your sins so you can have hope and inheritance and I'm going to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit and I'm going to walk with you through everything that I've asked you to do. Everything, I'm right here with you. Because he is the Messiah, we can have freedom. Freedom from our burdens, freedom from our habits, our addictions, our pride, our anger, our greed, our lust, our selfish desires. You continue the list. Continue the list in your own mind. You know what you struggle with. You know those things that have have you bound and feeling like you can't breathe. Right? Because it's not just forgiveness for our sins that we get from Jesus. It's freedom from their bondage. Because I don't know if you have ever been in a place in your life where something has a hold of you and you just don't know how to kick it. You've tried and had a good few weeks and then gone right back to it or you've struggled and it's just wearing you down and you don't feel like you can make a good decision. You don't feel like you can get up and go to that same old job and make just barely enough to get by. You don't know if you're ever going to be successful. You don't know if you're ever going to be the husband that your wife really needs. That struggle is there and it makes you feel like you're completely tied down. But Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of the living God said, no, I came to bring you freedom from that. Because he is the Messiah, the son of the living God, not just a prophet. Not just another John the Baptist. Not just another great moral teacher. He is the one. So I hesitate to step into this next part because what I want to believe, I want to believe that we all have a firm grasp. Everyone in this building, everyone in our community that claims to be a Christian, I want to believe that we all would say boldly, Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. I want to I believe that. But as I do some research, 
as I, I look at different things and, and think about things that are going on around us. And, and, and sometimes in our church, some of the, the conversations, I, I do begin to wonder if we really believe in that Jesus, the one who is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. I don't know if I've said that yet. Have I, I, just making sure, right? I don't know if we really believe that the Jesus we want to worship is the one from Scripture or if it's some, some distorted Jesus that we've made up. We don't have that option. We don't, we don't have a, a build a Jesus option in our life. There's not that in Scripture. It is either the one in Scripture or it's not at all. Right, and so um, Ligonier Ministries put out a survey recently, uh, and they just entitled it, Who Do You Say Jesus Is? Um, and so their results, uh, they, they polled evan- evangelicals, which is an evangelical is a person who is committed to the Christian gospel message that Jesus Christ is the Savior of humanity. And so if you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, then, and you believe that he did what he said he did, um, and he is who he said he is, and you're an evangelical, right? It's a big word for saying, I believe Jesus uh, came to earth, lived a perfect life, uh, died for my sins and redeemed me, and it's because of him I can have a relationship with God. Um, then you're an evangelical, right? So this is not just a, a, a generic poll of the world around us. This is a poll of evangelicals, and this is what we find out from them. Um, they hold, uh, hold to a host of beliefs that are far from Scripture. of them said that they believe God accepts the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. All religions. Wrap your brain around that for a minute. Over half believe that God accepts all religions. Nearly half believe that God learns and adapts to different circumstances. Um, The only reason you need to learn and adapt is if you're wrong. Um, The God of the Bible that we read is not wrong. Um, 70% strongly agree that Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. Jesus is God. He was not created. He's always been. 38% see Jesus as a great teacher, but he was not God. These are evangelicals. Evangelicals who believe the gospel believe that Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. 60% say the Holy Spirit is a force, but is not a personal being. 27% think the Holy Spirit can tell me to do something which is forbidden in the Bible. And yet 94% agree that the Bible has the authority to tell us what we must do. 57% believe everyone sins a little, but most people are good by nature. And 65% think everyone is born innocent in the eyes of God. 37% agree that religious belief is a matter of personal opinion. It is not about objective truth. What I'm sharing with you today, there's no other way for me to state it. I can't serve it up on a different platter. I can't make it look nice. We can't put ice cream on top of it and pretend that parts of it aren't real and just enjoy the parts we like. The truth is this, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And that is the foundation of what the church is built on. Your relationship to God is built on that truth. And we can't adjust it. As much as we want to. I've been in conversations with people, and so have you, that that believe differently. And they're hurting and they're struggling because they can't totally get on board with who Jesus is and what Scripture is saying. And and they don't know what to do, but they want the freedom and the hope that we have in Jesus. But we don't get to change that. No matter how much we want to, no matter how much it crushes us to want to change and make adjustments to the truth of God's Word. We just can't do it. That doesn't mean we can't love them. That's not a cop-out. We don't get to look at them and say, well, they don't believe like I do, so I'm out. I'm going to go over here. If anything, knowing, knowing the answer to the question of who do you say I am should drive us to work harder, to do more, to love deeper and more unconditionally the people who haven't seen who Jesus is yet. Because even Peter, Jesus said to him, Nobody told you this. Nobody told you the answer to this question, and yet you know. You know because God has revealed it to you. And if you know confidently the answer to this question, it's because God, through the Holy Spirit, has revealed it to you. And who are we to keep that to ourselves? 
Who are we to stand back and judge people who are struggling to realize this, struggling to believe and understand what the answer to the question of who do you say I am is? We are supposed to step into those struggles, into those difficulties, into those people's lives and say, hey, I got you. I got you. Let's talk. Let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. Let me show you what a Messiah, what the Son of the living God looks like in my life. And we don't stop until the Holy Spirit shows them in their life. The answer to this question is going to be more evident in what you do than anything you will ever say. What if every day we woke up and we were asked, who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? Some days it's harder to respond than others, isn't it? Some days it's hard to get up and put that on and go walk through that life again. To know that people, especially in our culture today, have different ideas. They have different thought processes. And we're supposed to go and we're supposed to live in and among everyone. And we're supposed to show love to everyone. We're supposed to show grace and mercy and forgiveness. And it's hard because people suck. Right? Right? Do you know that you and I are a people? And we also do sometimes. And yet, Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. If we can somehow embrace that and remember that every day, it's a choice we have to make every day. To see Him for who He is and live a life like He is who He said He is. Because if we really believe Jesus has saved us and he's delivered us from the bondage of all of our habits and our, our hang-ups and our issues and our history and, and those things that happen to us that we have no control over, if we really believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, man, our life's going to look different. No one's going to have to ask you what you believe about Jesus if you're living like you believe he is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Let's pray. God, we just come to you this morning. Uh, Father, just thank you for uh, your word. God, your truth is, uh, God, it's just uncomfortable. Um, it'd be really cool if we could adjust it and, and tweak it um, and make it, make it more easy. Um, but God, then it would absolutely change everything. Um, God, the answer to this question that we've dove into today is, is so, so clear. God, help us to live in such a way that we never have to tell anybody how we feel about Jesus or who we believe that he is. God, help us to live in such a way that people see that there's something different. God, and they, they want to know what it is. God, help us to be ready every day as we take our, our, first, uh, our first breath when we wake up in the morning. Help us to answer that question of who do you say I am with boldness and confidence and courage as we step into our day knowing that your son Jesus is the Messiah, he is the anointed one, he is your son, and that you are the living God, that we get to worship, God, we get to serve. And God, let us just feel the, the honor and that responsibility and that privilege, God. We love you. Thank you for being with us today. Help us to take something from uh, worship and teaching today and help us to do something with it as we go. God, we love you. Jesus' name I pray. Amen.